and a fellow of Christ College, Cambridge. He has been a secretary of the Royal Society and president of the Royal College of Pathologists. He was also the founder president of the UK Academy of Medical Sciences. Peter has a PhD from uh, Cambridge and um, uh, among his other activities, he's a beekeeper. And even though we have not tasted yet the honey that um, uh, Peter's bees are producing, I'm sure we are going to taste the sting of his uh, thoughts. Uh, having said that, uh, John Salston yesterday said that we are sitting at the uh, shoulders of giants. So I'm presenting to you one of those giants. Thank you very much. I'm not going to be able to live up to that introduction. Um, I'd like to thank the organizers very much for allowing me to talk on this topic of religion as an evolutionary adaptation, and I will try to persuade you that it actually has some relevance to the subject of this meeting. Um, the proposition that I'm going to make to you, um, you can read it for yourself, um, is that although Darwin was worried that evolution by natural selection would be seen as opposed to religion as it was then and still widely, widely is, particularly among certain groups in the United States, um, that he was actually mistaken in believing that there was a conflict and that in fact religions arose to meet a very peculiarly human need, which is that it maintains important aspects of human behavior that vary among groups and you'll notice I've put that in bold because it's very important we're discussing group behavior here. The behavior that distinguishes humans from monkeys or dogs or worms is quite clearly genetic, and the variation between individual members of a group is very complicated. There are a lot of features there like intelligence that are uh, distributed on a normal distribution. It's affected by early life. It's affected by many social factors. But it is here the differences in behavior that defines different groups of human beings. And they require to be kept sufficiently constant over a sufficiently large number of people and a sufficiently large span of time measured in generations um, that natural selection, um, working on cultural evolution, which I will explain to you, um, can act upon them. And I, that is why we have religions, and that is why religions have some of the properties, some desirable and some undesirable, they do. Um, the outline of the talk, I just tell you, I'm going to briefly compare genetic and cultural evolution for those among you who perhaps are not evolutionary biologists or scientists. I will compare the control of group behavior in bees from that in humans because a lot of sociobiology and the speculation on this kind of came from studies of bees and talk about the problems of group selection in general. I'll then talk about the role of religious prescriptions, and finally, I shall talk about the implications of this for the rest of this meeting. Well, genetic evolution, evolution as first described, describes the processes by which all different life forms have developed from a single ancestor. I may say that is not a discovery of Darwin's. Lamarck already knew this, um, uh, and probably Darwin's grandfather, that we came from a common ancestor. We now believe these ancestors are the archaea, rather recently described microorganisms which are rather more like eukaryotes than ordinary bacteria which seem to have separated very earlier. And these very early organisms were responsible for actually creating the first free oxygen itself showing that there couldn't have been animals at that time because there was no oxygen for them to breed. And interestingly enough the archaea are still about three and a half billion years later um, their descendants are still with us. And I'd like to give you a timeline because that's important and if we uh, assume the universe is a year old for convenience. Um, the Earth is about four months old. The archaea appeared about 11 weeks ago. The last shared ancestor of men and chimpanzees occurred three and a half hours ago. Um, Homo sapiens sapiens, modern man, Cro-Magnon man, appeared four minutes ago. 
and the agricultural revolution, which started civilization such as we know it, uh, occurred about 21 seconds ago. So it's all pretty recent. And there have only been, because man has a long generation time, about 4,000 generations of humans on average. It's worth pointing out that E. coli goes through that number of generations in about two months, and mice in about 650 years. And the behavior of E. coli and mice over these time scales hasn't actually changed at all. Um, uh, it's, while man has gone in the last 10,000 years from the Stone Age to the Silicon Chip Age and has changed immensely in the way he lives his life. And the point of this is, uh, we'll come back to genetic evolution is actually quite slow. Um, Darwin's great discovery was natural selection. And natural selection favors the survival of those who leave the most progeny that will themselves reproduce. The last phrase is extremely important. It is naive students of evolution tell you that selection stops working at the end of reproductive life. That, of course, is completely untrue. It's no good leaving children who are going to starve to death. Um, uh, and humans are unique in the fact that about 25% of one's lifespan is spent dependent on one's parents, which is very unusual in man, and therefore uh, evolutionary selection works much after the end of um, reproductive life. Second important point is natural selection can work only on pressures that exist at the present, it cannot work on future, uh, it doesn't anticipate future events, and above all it has no goal. Well, that is where Lamarck was so wrong and Darwin was right, evolution doesn't lead anywhere in particular, it goes. It's also one reason, as I will come back to, that uh, projecting evolutionary speculation to the future even if John Harris does it, is an extremely dangerous thing to do because the future will surprise us all. Um, fourth important point here is the enormous importance of parasitism as a driver of natural selection, which is frequently underestimated. Example I always like to give is if you assume for a moment that HIV were to change so it could spread like flu and would really become a major pandemic, then the planet would probably be inhabited after a couple of generations by those rare mutants that don't have the receptors for HIV, that don't carry CD4 or CCR5. And there's no reason to believe they'd be particularly beautiful, particularly clever, particularly strong, or particularly moral, but they don't have receptors for a virus that kills everyone else. That is how evolution works. Now, whoop. Now, this slide is not put in just for the benefit of John Salston. Um, it was already in the talk beforehand. Um, social Darwinism and this phrase, the survival of the fittest, which I agree entirely, is an unfortunate term. It was actually coined by Herbert Spencer, a well-known 19th century philosopher, actually a bit older than Darwin. But both Darwin used it and Huxley, as I will show you later, most certainly used it. And its real problem is that it confuses competition with conflict. Um, uh, this is a confusion which had terrible political consequences was adopted both by Marx and by Hitler who believed that su survival involved conflict between the fitter and the less fit and there was some duty of those who consider themselves more fit to eradicate the, the less fit. I would point out to you that this is actually quite uncommon in animal evolution. All the herbivores who live on the African plains do not try to eradicate each other. As a matter of fact, the carnivores don't even try to eradicate each other. Lions don't try to eradicate hunting dogs, or vice versa. Tigers actually like to have leopards about because they can steal their prey, but they don't try to exterminate them. And the idea, therefore, that competition um, always involves conflict is quite wrong. There's a rather pretty example here, um, which I won't go into, which is between the gray squirrels and the red squirrels, and people always thought the gray squirrels either killed the red squirrels or at least took their food, but actually that's all quite wrong. They both suffer from the squirrel pox virus that kills the red squirrels, but the gray squirrels survive, and therefore where the two coexist, the red squirrels die of disease, which is um, a quite satisfying explanation. I now turn to cultural evolution, and culture used in this sense has a very specific meaning. It describes the transmission between uh, horizontally and vertically of information, particularly information about behavior between individuals and generations by any means other than through the genome. Um, cultural evolution has been described in animals 
um, and was transmitted originally entirely by example. Um, and as John Harris has already told you, um, uh, detailed cultural evolution is, is characteristic of humans and was hugely influenced by the development of language. Um, and probably all humans had some form of language. But the oral transmission about 200 generations ago, which is only 5% of human development, uh, was enormously changed again by the development of writing so that information could be stored permanently and could be transmitted other than by actually being with the people concerned. And then it was changed again, probably even more fundamentally by the introduction of electronic means of communication about two generations ago. And that's such a short time that we really can't see where that's going. Cultural evolution also works by natural selection. That's clear enough. But it is worth pointing out that it's quite different from genetic evolution because there are no cultural species. In other words, there are no cultures that cannot interbreed. And actually, that was something Darwin had quite wrong because he believed that sexual selection would stop races and people's mi mixing. Um, and history has shown that that was um, not a correct prediction. Um, uh, and there is no non-blending inheritance, something which comes out of Mendel, you know, things don't skip generations the way they do in genetic evolution. And therefore, the attempt to produce cultural analogues of genes, the culture genes of Edmund Wilson, or the memes of Richard Dawkins, I have written here, shouldn't be taken too seriously. I was feeling slightly polite when I wrote this. They're actually a load of nonsense. Um, it's perfectly clear that cultural evolution works on groups. It's all about language, it's all about communication. It's completely unreasonable to believe that it could work in any other way than working on groups, um, and indeed it does. The advantage of cultural evolution is that it's much faster, of course. Uh, genetic evolution works at breeding, happens about three or four times a century in man. Um, cultural evolution occurs all the time. It can be disseminated to the ends of the earth now in minutes, and it probably allows greater ranges of behavior than we could uh, imagine being in the genome, and I gave the examples here I've given often before, is how easy would it be to encode genes that would tell you how to fly an airliner or to fill in a tax return or various other implausible things of this description. Disadvantages are, of course, that it's much less firmly fixed in the population. Genetic gains, everybody has, they're in the populations. Uh, cultural evolution is often, uh, was often only held in the hands of the literate minority, which was frequently the priesthood. And there are classic examples of how it was lost, one of the most striking being the Mayas in southern Mexico, who when their priesthood was destroyed by the Spaniards, this very sophisticated population returned to an early Stone Age culture until very recently. So one has to be aware of that. Now before going on to discuss religion, I must briefly say something about honeybees, because they've greatly influenced the sociobiologists, and actually me. Um, they are one of the few species other than man that relies on cooperation of individuals doing different tasks which are not based on anatomical castes. When the honeybee's copulation is complicated, there is a queen um, who is a fertile female who does nothing actually than laying eggs, plus or minus sperm, though whether she lays an egg or an egg plus a sperm is not decided by the queen, it's decided by the workers. Um, and that gives rise either to diploid females, if there's an egg and a sperm, or a haploid male, uh, which is defended directly from the queen only. And this is a very peculiar method of sex determination, which is used by honeybees, but not incidentally by termites. The males mate with a virgin queen on a mating flight, and the workers do everything else, but not all at the same time. Different parts of their lives, they do different things, um, and they do them in different ways. They can either be tidy builders of cells or untidy. They can be aggressive or they can be docile. They can be industrious and in gathering honey or lazy. They can rapidly swarm or they can be swarming averse, as the deer keepers prefer the latter. And these variations are entirely genetically determined and every beekeeper knows this because of what is called the requeening experiment. If you don't like the way your colony behaves, which is not infrequent, um, what you do is you introduce a newly mated queen uh, from a better colony, and then the workers that grow up in the hive learn nothing from the bad workers they grow up among. They behave entirely according to their genetic inheritance. And this clearly involves group selection. It also shows that bees do not have free will, and I will therefore argue that bees don't need religion. Whether they have it or not, of course, I don't know. Um, bee altruism 